Good morning and welcome to our Sunday service this morning on this very special Mother's Day. Thank you for joining us and we pray that the Lord will reveal himself to you in a very special way as we come together to worship this morning. Ndia nibulisa nonkenge gama lenkosi yetu u Jesu Christu. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This week we have a few birthdays coming up. On the 11th, which is Tuesday, it's Angus Wilson's birthday. He's a new member in our congregation. And then on the 15th of May, which is Saturday, it's one of our elders' birthday, Terry Brickhill. So Angus, Terry and anybody else celebrating a birthday this week, happy, happy birthday. We hope that you will have an amazing day on your birthday and most of all that God will bless you and keep you in this here to come. We're going to start our service today by listening to the hymn Praise the Lord the Almighty. Praise to the Lord the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh my soul, praise Him for He is Thy health and salvation.
call to worship today comes from Isaiah 49, verse 15 and 16, and here we read the following. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on her child that she has born? Though she may forget, I will never forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hand. Your walls are ever before me. These verses remind us this morning that God will never forget us. Our names are permanently engraved, even tattooed onto the palm of his hand. Our Lord will always love us with the same love a mother has for her child. This love is fierce and ferocious. This love forgives all, understands all, is always kind. This love keeps no records of wrongs, is always patient, and this love is uncompromising, unconditional, and undeterred. This is the love that the Lord has for us. And so let's come and draw near to God, who loves us in this way. Let's come to share with the Lord what's on our hearts, our minds, our souls. Let's come to focus our attention on him as we praise him, as we worship him, as we listen to him. Let's do this with a moment of silent and individual prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, what can we do to show you our gratitude? What can we say to express our appreciation for all you do for us? Lord, you mean so much to us. You are constantly around us, constantly loving us, constantly looking out for us, just as a mother does. You care for us tenderly. You teach us softly and with grace. You show us mercy time and time again. You love us fiercely and ferociously. Thank you that we can be called your children. We praise you for all you do. We praise you for always being there, for providing, for walking and talking to us, for always wrapping us up in your strong arms where we feel safe when the world becomes overwhelming. Lord, we come into your presence this morning because we want to spend time with you. We come into your presence because we want to worship you. And as we do this, Lord, we know that there are things in our lives that we need to work on, things we need to change. So Holy Spirit, move in us. Make us aware of the things in our lives that we need to do differently. Make us aware of where and how we need to change so that your power and your glory can shine through us. Lord, you know this past week where we've let you down. The times your love was not seen in us. The times we refused to forgive. The times we held on to a grudge. The times we gossiped. The times we gave in to pride and ego. The times we judged and hated without knowing or even taking the time to understand the whole situation. Lord, we come to you now silently and individually to confess our sins to you. Hear our confessions. Lord, see our repentive hearts. Let your waters of grace and mercy wash over us so that we can be cleansed and found acceptable in your sight. Thank you, Lord, that you promise when we truly and honestly repent, you forgive. You take our sins and you separate it far away from us, never to think of it again. Lord, if we truly come to repent this morning, do this for us now. Cleanse us. Forgive us. Have mercy upon us. Lord, you know the things that we are struggling with, the relationships we are battling in, the worries, fears and concerns that follow us around. 
You know the burdens we have and the problems we carry around with us daily. You know our darkest, deepest thoughts and the moments of despair and anxiety that grip our hearts. Lord, come and grant us your peace. Come and grant us your love. Holy Spirit, come and wrap us in your loving, motherly arms so that we can experience your presence today. Come and speak to us. Come and teach us. Come and reveal yourself to us. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are now going to listen to the hymn, Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. from the prophet Hosea and we're going to be reading chapter 11. I'll be reading from the NIV translation and you are more than welcome to follow along with me. Hosea 11. When Israel was a child I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? Swords will flash in their cities, will destroy the bars of their gates and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. 
Even if I call to the Most High, He will by no means exalt them. How can I give up Ephraim? How can I hand you over Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zebuim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger. I will, and nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from Assyria. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. And here ends our reading this morning. May the Lord bless to us the understanding of his holy word. As we all know, today in South Africa, it's Mother's Day. And so many moms around our country are woken up this morning with breakfast in bed or perhaps even a cup of coffee. And hopefully some of them got a little prezi as a token of our thanks and appreciation. Because today we thank and appreciate our moms as we think about everything they do for us and all the times they carry our burdens for us and with us and all the times they pray for us without us even knowing. And so it's only fitting that today we read one of the readings from the Old Testament where God is depicted and described as a mother. But before we get into this text, perhaps it'll be a good idea for us to just orientate ourselves a little bit. Because Hosea isn't really a book that we would read on our own, like we would read the book of Psalms or read the Gospels. It's also not a text that we often hear preached from. So who was Hosea? What's this book about? What do we need to know in order to understand our text a little better? First things first, who was Hosea? Well, we probably all know that Hosea was a prophet. He began preaching about 10 years after Amos, and he was the last prophet that God actually sent to the 10 tribes in the north before exile occurred. So in a way, Hosea is their last warning. But Hosea's ministry was very, very different to the other prophets. Because Hosea used words of affection rather than accusation. He wooed the people rather than warning them. He was tender rather than tough. And he proclaimed mercy rather than justice. Strange way to prophecy if you the last prophet, the last hope, the last warning to the people, isn't it? Now, a key word for the prophet Hosea is the Hebrew word chesed. Now, this is a word we can't really translate into English properly because it means so many different things. It's a covenant word and it's used to describe the love that God has for his people. It's a true love. It's a loyal love. It's a loving, faithful kindness that God shows his people. It's a love that loves despite and in spite of anything and everything. It's a remarkable love. But something that really made this prophet very remarkable is that God wanted him to understand God's feelings. And so God took him on an extraordinary experience. Now, chapter 1 to 3 gives us background of this special experience. We learn that in, the very, uh, in these very early chapters, that God told Hosea to marry a prostitute. Something that's quite shocking, especially for somebody called to be God's spokesperson. Hosea's wife tried to turn her life around, and then she had three children. But we soon find out that at least one of these children were not Hosea's child. And so his wife then returned to her old ways and once again became a prostitute. But Hosea goes out to find her. 
brings her back home. He has an honest and very straight conversation with her. And then he begins to court her again. He tries to start all over with his wife. He forgives her everything. Even when Hosea's own children don't particularly like their mom because of what she's doing. And so Hosea's marriage becomes a metaphor for the relationship between God and Israel. God remains faithful. God keeps on trying. God is always constant, always there, just like Hosea is. But the people are unfaithful. They do their own thing. They worship other gods and they don't seem to care about God at all, just like Hosea's wife. So it seems that God recognizes that the people don't feel the same way about him as he does about them. Yet, he can't let them go and he can't let them down. And this brings us to our reading this morning. So let's take a deeper look. These 11 verses show us God's gracious, merciful and steadfast loving character. Walter Brueggemann, a famous Old Testament scholar, actually says that this is one of the most remarkable revelations in the entire prophetic literature of the Old Testament. And the reason for this is because it shows us the heart and the mind of God in a remarkable way. Isaiah 11 begins by reminding us of the exodus from Egypt, the deliverance from the oppression and captivity the people faced as slaves in Egypt. Saving them from Egypt was an act of love from God and it established the relationship between God and his people and the covenant that then followed at Mount Sinai after their rescue. But it seems that even though God saved Israel, even though God loved Israel, Israel provide, proved to be a little bit of a wayward child. Despite God's attentive, loving and faithfulness, Israel went off to do their own thing time and time again. They sacrificed to Baal, they burned incense before the idols, and they continued to move further and further and further away from God. But then in verses 3 and 4, we see the image of God as a mother. God who taught them how to walk. God who held them in his arms. God who healed them and led them with kindness and love. God who lifted the weight and burden off their shoulders and bent down to feed them. Here we see God's loving care in terms of teaching, comforting, healing and nourishing. All four actions ascribed to mothers in the Old Testament. Verse 5 to 7 then articulates how Israel is to be disciplined and punished. Instead of Egypt being the people's taskmaster, as it was in the past, it will now be Assyria who will occupy and oppress, oppress them. In the midst of their suffering, they will call out to God again, because that's what we know that Israel always do. But this time God will refuse to hear them. Now, if we stop reading the chapter at this point, it seems as if God has abandoned the people completely. But then the tone dramatically changes when we reach verse 8 to 9. Here we see God actually questioning himself. It seems that God uses a pattern that we often find in the laments. And it starts with the word how. How can I do this to my children who I love? How can I allow this to happen to my beloved little babies? We see a very rare glimpse into God's inner emotional turmoil. We see a conversation that God is almost having with himself. We see God agonizing. Now, according to the Torah, in Deuteronomy 21, rebellious sons can be stoned to death. But now, God can't bring himself to follow through on what the people actually deserve. We see here that God is willing to break his own law for the sake of his beloved children. In short, God is moved by compassion to pursue justice by forgiving and not punishing. God is willing to be gracious once again, 
given the people's unwillingness to repent and turn back to God, God is the one that's going to do the turning and show compassion once again. Now, what does this beautiful reading tell us today on Mother's Day? Is there a special message in here for moms? This week, I contacted a few mothers and grannies in our congregation and I wanted to find out two things. What is the greatest joy of being a mom or a granny? And what is the biggest challenge? And their responses made it clear that being a mom or granny develops and occurs in different stages. So shall we have a look and hear what they have to say? Now, being a mom starts a very long time before actually having children. And so this rose is for those moms. It starts out when we are little girls and we begin to play with dolls. We host tea parties for our teddies. And some girls are different. They catch bat butterflies and frogs and have silkworms and they take care of them as a mommy does. But as we become an adult, being a mom sometimes begins as we have to stand in for family and friends who have little babies. Yes, for the most part, we are seen as the fun auntie. We are there to feed sweets and to laugh and to play, but we also help here and there to change a nappy, to help with potty training. We are there when the little ones cry or throw a tent at tantrum, or even at times when they're a bit cheeky. But the beauty is, that we can give them back to mom and dad and we can get out as quickly as our legs can carry us. All these experiences influence us and prepare us as we start thinking about having children of our own as we grow up. Now, some people may argue, I would, that having pets is also like being a mom. When owning a pet, we are responsible for another life. And we have to care and give love. If our dog's afraid of thunder, if our cat has a tummy problem, we have to make sure that they get water and exercise and good food and go to the vet when something is wrong. But even when we have a pet, the responsibility is not as great as when we have a child. So moms who fall in this category, this rose is for you. Have fun. Have fun playing and learning what it is to be a mom as you support and encourage the little ones in your life. Enjoy being the fun auntie. God knows what a joy it is to be a fun aunt. And we all need those fun aunts to run to at times. Now, we cannot talk about having children without also talking about those who yearn to be mothers but aren't able to do so. Perhaps there is a medical reason why we can't fall pregnant or perhaps we did fall pregnant and then the worst thing happened. As we entered the doctor's room, there was no heartbeat. Women struggling with infertility and miscarriages often feel like failures. And so today this rose is for you. We often feel unworthy. We feel not good enough. We feel as if our bodies have failed us. After all, one thing that women are especially created for is to have children. And when we are unable to do this, it makes us feel less than. This is something that seems to be happening more and more, and yet we are not speaking about it, especially not in the church. But just because, that, just because we've had a miscarriage, it doesn't mean that we are not a mom. Technically, even if we aren't holding a baby in our arms, we are mothers. Because we still know the feeling of discovering life growing inside of us. We still know the feeling of loving someone so much without even meeting them. We already started planning a world for our little ones. And with one foul swoop, it's taken away. 
This is devastating and it hurts and it changes us forever. So moms out there who fall into this category, this rose is for you. Know that God understands. He knows the desires of your hearts. He knows how broken we feel. He knows how much we feel like a failure. God knows and he understands. May you experience God's comfort surround you. May you experience God carrying you in this time. May you experience God healing you physically, emotionally, mentally and spiritually as he holds you tightly. Then we get to another stage of being a mom. Having our first baby. To those of us who were pregnant and had babies during COVID times, this was even a greater challenge because suddenly our expectation of being pregnant and having a baby didn't meet reality at all. So this flower is for the new mothers among us. As lockdown came, we couldn't share our excitement with others because we had to keep isolated from one another. We had to make do with drive-by showers and showing our baby bunts on Zoom calls. Going to the doctor's visits were terrifying, especially as our partner couldn't come along with us and we didn't even know if they would be allowed in the delivery room. And then, while handling all these unknown elements of the virus, our due date came along and we were blessed enough to hold a little life in our arms. But it seems that it is here where the challenge then begins to overwhelm us even more. We learn how to function like a zombie with little to no sleep at all, especially if we are still breastfeeding. Dad can at least have a few hours sleep, but moms have to get up because they are the bottle. And so switching off or taking a minute for oneself becomes very difficult. Time becomes our greatest enemy because having time to cook and clean and feed and bath and burp and do laundry while also changing nappies, while also getting a few minutes sleep becomes a hectic new lifestyle we aren't prepared for. We think we prepared for it until it happens. On top of this, social media is constantly putting pressure on us to be perfect, to know exactly what to do 100% of the time, even though you are still trying to figure it out. We are so quickly branded a bad mom because we're not using this product or that product, or not knowing what this cry or that cry means from the baby. But even as we go through all this hecticness and we begin to adjust to new realities, we still have moments of incredible joy. At 3 a.m. when we are busy doing a feeding and the little one looks up at us with those big eyes, with a smile and with amazement, it tugs at our heartstrings. And we feel so lucky and so blessed beyond measure by God for choosing us and our partner to be the parents of this baby. When we hear them laugh or we seeing th see them doing something for the first time, like grabbing a finger or holding their neck up by themselves, the proud feeling we have is like no other. So moms out there going through this stage, this rose is for you. God understands. He knows how overwhelmed you feel at times and he knows that you don't always know what to do. And that's okay. Lucky for us, babies are a little bit more resilient than we give them credit. It is impossible for you to always know exactly what to do. But know that God is with you. God knows what to do. And there are people in your life who you can trust, who has a pretty good idea about raising children. A mom or a granny or a mother figure perhaps. So don't read all the blogs out there about how to raise a child. Don't compare yourself to what social media tells you. Be the best you can be, because that's all God asks of you. As you raise his little miracles, know that God is at your side and he will grant you all the wisdom and insight that you need.
The next stage of being a mom is perhaps adding another baby to the family or having children grow up a little. So this rose is for you. Suddenly, we begin to meet the terrible twos, the tiresome threes, the feisty fours, the fearsome fives, the simmering sixes, the strappy sevens, the evil eights, the nightmare nines, and the terrifying tens. And during all these different age groups, mom seemed to battle a difficult challenge, the challenge of guilt. In today's world, being a stay-at-home mom isn't a, is a luxury because most of us need more than one salary to just survive. So most moms have to be working moms. And this is where the guilt starts creeping in. When we are at work, we feel guilty for not being with our child. When we are with our child, we feel guilty for not playing with them in the right manner. We feel guilty because we wonder, am I feeding this child correctly? We feel guilty because when they get to the why stage, we wonder, am I answering them right? We worry about them physically, we worry about them emotionally, we worry about them mentally. Are they where they are supposed to be at according to their age? Are we stimulating this child enough? Are they learning things in the right time? We struggle as moms because we compare ourselves to the friends and the families that drive safer cars or can buy more expensive clothes, can give better kids parties. And when we do this, we begin to feel as if we aren't good enough. This leads us to feel overwhelmed most of the time. Not even to mention homework. How can the maths that we did in school be different to the maths the kids are doing in school nowadays? Where are we supposed to find more time to help with school projects? And what do we even know to say when our child comes crying home from school because a friend was mean at them? How do we know when to intervene and when to allow the child to learn by him or herself? How do we help without hovering? How do we discipline and teach our children without scarring them for life? Yet even in these realities and in these moments, we still have joy. That moment our kid runs up to us, gives us a big hug and we hear the little voice go, I love you, mom. Or that moment we watch them sleep and we realize that we've never experienced a much deeper love for anyone or anything else, quite as much as we love these little ones. It gives us joy when we see our children happy and we are reminded that they often find happiness in the smallest of things. So to mamas in this stage, this rose is for you. God knows. He knows how overwhelming it can all be. He knows the worries and anxieties that we have about our children. He knows how we stress when they are sick or how freaked out we get when we think we aren't good enough. He knows that days that are tough. And on top of raising the children, we still have normal troubles at work or we sometimes fight with our partner. God knows. And he will come alongside you and he will help you to teach your child well. He is there with the cords of kindness and love to help carry your burdens. He's there to look after your children and protect them when you can't always be, like when they are away at school. God knows we are trying our best and that is all he asks for. He knows that this is the one job that you want to excel in and he will help you do that. Then we get to another stage of being a mom dealing and suddenly having someone in our home that has had undergone an overnight transformation and not in a good way. Being the mom of a teenager. This rose is for you. Suddenly our sweet little angels turn on us. Mood swings, back chat, cheeky behavior and pushing boundaries becomes the norm of the day. Suddenly, anything and everything we have to say is old-fashioned. 
Apparently, we suddenly understand nothing, and we are told how dumb we are on a daily basis. Friends become more important in various different ways, and this is when our worry sets in big time. We worry that our children will fall in with the wrong crowd. We worry about drugs, wrong choices, wrong influences. We worry about, are they hiding something from us? Our guilt also seems to go into overdrive because our children then come to us and say things like, Mom, so-and-so has this bag or these shoes or that PlayStation. You don't love me if you don't give me those things too. It's also at this stage where our dear children become master manipulators because they play the parents off against one another. But Mom, Dad said I could go to the party. You're such a drag. You never let us do anything fun. Sound familiar? But even in these moments, there are times of joy, times when we took to explain something to our teenager and they get it, praise be to God. Perhaps you've told them that they're not allowed to go to a party and a couple of days later they come back and go, gee mom, thanks for not allowing me to go to that party. Turns out things happened at that party that wasn't that great. We still have those moments even though they may be few and far between when our teenager comes to us and says, I love you and I appreciate you. And then we know that it really truly is sincere. Moms in this stage, this rose is for you. God knows. He knows how mean our teenagers can be. He knows how they sometimes break our hearts with the things that they say and the things that they do. He knows that every day with a teenager is not a walk in the park. He's got you, mum. It's in this time where your actions of love will speak louder than your words. It's in these times where being there for your children, even when they disappoint you, is of cardinal importance. It is in this phase where they learn that no matter what, you will have their backs. But that you will also talk to them about things you see happening when they go down the wrong path. God knows it isn't easy. He knows the scary realities that are out there. He knows the places and the spaces our teenagers hang out. He knows our hearts as a mother. At this stage, praying for our children is of utmost importance. God hears our prayers. He knows our hearts and he will be with you in every single situation, at every turn and in every event. The next stage of being a mom is waking up one morning and suddenly your children are all grown up. This rose is for you. Suddenly, you have to sit on the side and watch them make big life decisions. Decisions that only they can make. Massive decisions. Like, what am I going to study? Like, who am I going to marry? like will we immigrate and yes they will sometimes decide to do something that we won't think is a good idea especially if they decide to go and live far far away or if they marry someone that we have deep concerns over but it is at this stage where we need to breathe moms we have taught them all we can we have taught them how to measure up the pros and the cons we have taught them how to fall on their feet and how to suffer the consequences of their decisions. At this point, we as moms have to let go and let God. Even in this life cycle, being a mom still brings joy to our hearts when we know a visit is coming up where we can spend some quality time together. Receiving that call from your child where they just want to check in and see how mom's doing. Those text messages or WhatsApp messages that come through reminding us that they love us and appreciate us. Moms at the stage, this rose is for you. God knows. Worrying about our children don't get less the older they get. In fact, small kids, small problems, big kids, big problems. But God knows. 
He hears the prayers that you send up daily for your children. He knows how much you worry, how much you care, how much you stress about them. God knows. And just as God provided and looked after you when you were young, so he will look after your children too. He is their parent too. He loves them even more than you do. So know that God will keep your children in the palm of his hand and he will be with them always. Then another stage of being a mom is one day receiving that call and hearing the words, Mom, we are going to have a baby. You'll be a granny or a great granny. Moms in this stage, this rose is for you. Most moms say that being a mom is the most rewarding job ever. But most grannies say that being a granny is even better. To see our children raise our grandchildren and children uh, and great-grandchildren with the same morals and manners as we taught shows us that we've done something right. It is suddenly being in this phase where our children realize how much we love them, how much we've done for them, and how much we've sacrificed for them. And so a different, deeper kind of love develops between us and our children, and perhaps even our grandchildren. It is sometimes hard for us as mothers to bite our tongue, especially when we see our children or grandchildren raise their children in ways that seem strange to us. It is sometimes a challenge when we don't live close enough to hug our grandchildren or great-grandchildren on an everyday basis. And God knows this. But it is at this point we enjoy, like we did in phase one, to play and laugh and hand out sweets and then give them back to the parents and have a nap. It is here where we relive our youth as we play our games with the little ones and as they teach us some new tricks. It is also here when we receive a lot of help from especially our grandchildren when it comes to things like cell phones, right? God knows your heart as a granny and a great granny. And so this rose is for you. He knows that every day isn't easy, especially if our loved ones live far away. He knows that every day grows more challenging as we are confronted with words and fashion choices of our grandchildren that really don't make sense to us at all. God also knows the love that you have for your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. If you are in a position where you know your grandchildren or great-grandchildren, know that you are richly blessed. Today we give this bouquet of flowers to all the moms out there. To all the moms out there, thank you for who you are. We appreciate you and we love you. Our reading this morning reminds us that God has the heart of a mother. God went through all these different stages and phases with Israel. As our reading in verse 3 and 4 remind us, God taught, comforted, healed and nourished Israel just as a mother does. And so God gets every stage and phase that we go through as moms. He also knows every stage and phase we go through as children. He knows those moments when we miss our moms who might be in the Lord's nearer presence on this Mother's Day. Our reading reminds us that God has a conversation with himself in verses 8 to 9, a conversation that most parents probably often have with themselves too, especially when they face a crisis with their children. Know that God therefore gets the questions and the challenges, the worries and the concerns that we have. But just like our moms loved us with an everlasting, faithful, uncompromising love, God loves us more.
God loves us so much that he will always try and do anything and everything to reconcile with us. He loves us more than we can ever know and ever comprehend. And our reading from Hosea 11 this morning reminds us of that once again. So today, whether you are a mom or not, we have all experienced the love of a mother or a mother figure in our lives who had our backs, who was always there, who was always available, a shoulder to cry on and a wise one to go and seek advice from. God remains all of that for us now. Enjoy today, whatever you may be doing. Remember to phone your mom or share a special thought for a mom who is in heaven. And know that the Lord our God loves you everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for moms and grannies and great grannies and mother figures in our lives. Thank you for the love that they teach us. Thank you for the compassion that they teach us. Thank you for the wise words they give us. Thank you that they are always there, having our backs and that we can re rely on them. We ask you, Lord, to bless all the mothers in our congregation. Those who have animal children, those who only have family members who have babies, those who've lost children, those who have little children, babies, toddlers, teenagers, adult children, or great-grandchildren. We ask you, Lord, that you keep our moms in your hands of protection, that you'll bless them and keep them and make your face to shine upon them. Lord, thank you that we can know that you love us with the same love, a love that is uncompromising, a love that always shows loving faithfulness, a love that always wraps us in your arms, a love that loves despite of, in spite of, a love that is constant. Thank you that we can learn that love from you. We pray for the marriages and the families in our congregation. We ask, Lord, that you will strengthen the marriages, that you will help the parents as they look after their children, that you'll help the grannies and grandpas as they look after their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Lord, thank you for your love. We ask that you be with those of us who are ill, those of us who are worried, those of us who are depressed, those of us who are anxious and feel overwhelmed, grant us your peace, grant us your love, grant us your compassion, and be with us this week until we meet again. Amen. We are now going to listen to a special rendition of Amazing Grace that is specially written for moms.
ubabalo lenkosi yetu u Yesu Kristu utando lokatiko ubudlelwana lo moyo uyinkwele malube nane nonke and now mag ek genade van Christus die liefde van God en die gemeenskap van die Heilige Gees met elke van julle wees en bly and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love now and forevermore amen happy mother's day and enjoy your day together be blessed and we'll see you again next week